Do you feel lost in the scriptures? Start here. Hello, my friends. Welcome, welcome. I'm so excited to dive into the scriptures with you today. And I have got to back up. Well, first of all, back up the camera because I have a zit coming in. Can I tell you? That is one of the most annoying things I found about getting in my 40s is I am like covered in wrinkles, but also still get zits. Anyone with me? Can you? Can you tell me in the comments below? All right, question of the day. Do you think life would be better if we all had perfect recall? I love Hallmark movies, and one of my favorites is um, Aurora Tea Garden. If you've never seen it, super fun uh, murder mysteries. And the mom in the show is an actress who apparently has perfect recall. She can remember every single day of her life. And I think that would be awful, but also the scriptures tell us that we need to remember. And we're going to dive into that. So I'm curious what you think. Tell me in the comments below. Do you think that the world would be a better place if everyone had perfect total recall? And first, let's dive into the storyline this week with some terrible art. This week's storyline is nice and short, and apparently it excited me so much I forgot how to write the number one. Nephi was the leader of his community, and he set apart his brothers, Jacob and Joseph, as priests and teachers. Jacob taught his people the words of Isaiah. He taught them about the miraculous atonement of Jesus Christ. He warned the Nephites that everyone must come to God's judgment bar. He taught them to repent. He warned them against Satan's temptations. He taught them about a loving God, and he also prophesied of the scattering and gathering of Israel. And that's what's happening in Come Follow Me this week. Okay, I love that terrible art. I hope it makes you feel better about your own artistic skills. I actually had someone ask me if I could share a link to the images of my terrible art. Anyway, my terrible art is now linked in the show notes if you want to print it out as a reminder of what's going on this week. Now, I have done you a disservice. Can I just say that? How could you? I forgot to mention where in the world we are. And I want to do this because I have always found the geography of the Book of Mormon a little bit confusing. So I'm going to pull out, this is a shame shameless plug, actually. I was going to plug this directly, but now I'm doing it subtly for you. I make study guides, by the way, for kids and for teens. They're daily study guides and they're flipping amazing. But I wanted to show you where we're at in the Book of Mormon physically. So Lehi and his family, they've landed in the promised land, right? So here is the land of their first inheritance. And then back a couple weeks ago, Nephi is inspired to leave Laman and Lemuel because they're basically going to murder him. And so he actually heads to the east. And we will talk as we go through this year about what's going on, who's where, why all of this is happening. But for now, just know that Laman and his people are in the west and Nephi and his people have had to travel to the east uh, more inland. And that is where we are physically. All right, let's move on to investigate. There is a fabulous set of verses in here. So we're going to go to 2 Nephi chapter 9. My French wanted to come out there. Chapitre 9. Yeah, if anyone speaks French, just ignore everything I just said because that was terrible French. Okay, 2 Nephi chapter 9 will basically be in verses 39 through 44. All right, and we're going to be doing one of my favorite scripture skills, which is making lists. If you are type A like me, lists are super fun. And even if you're not type A, it's just kind of cool to have lists in the margins of your scriptures. So let's practice this scripture skill of making lists because as you'll note in verse 39 um, and through 44, the word remember should shows up multiple times. And so we are going to make a list of the things that we are told that we should remember. All right, let's head to 2 Nephi 9, and we are going to start marking in verses 39 through 44 every time it says remember. I'm tracing here. I love to trace. And so I am tracing the word remember in verses 39, in 40, in 41, and in 44. And now I'm going to make a list. What are the things that we are actually told that we should remember? So in verse 39, it has two things we're supposed to remember. We're supposed to remember that being carnally minded is death and being spiritually minded is eternal life. And then in verse 40, I love this one. We're just told to remember how great Jesus is. Don't you love that? So many problems in the world would be solved if we just remembered how awesome Jesus is. Then in verse 41, we are told to remember that Jesus's path, that covenant path, it is narrow and it is straight. And then verse 44, we are told, and this is actually the people at the time are being told to remember the prophet's words, but we are also being told to remember our prophet's words. 
And this brings me back to my question of the day. Do you think that the world would be better if everybody had perfect total recall? I can't remember which phrase is right, if it's perfect recall or total recall. So I'm just putting both together. (laughs) Someone tell me that in the comments below. Which one is it? Perfect recall, total recall? Anyway, I'm not sure I want to remember a lot of the things that have happened in my life. I'm kind of glad. I don't know. Tell me what you think in the comments below. Okay. This comes from second Nephi 10 verse three. Now, why are we diving into this verify section? Um, I actually was just talking to a friend who was like, Oh, I love that you do this because there are a lot of cultural beliefs in the church that are not necessarily backed up by facts. And so as we find them in the scriptures, I want to find out, is this just a cultural belief or is this an actual fact? So let's turn to second Nephi 10 to find out. Okay. So second Nephi chapter 10 verse three says something that's really, uh, pretty harsh against the Israelites and is a little bit sobering. And it says there is none other nation on earth that would crucify their God. So we know that God has created worlds without number. And the rumor is that not only is it just the ancient Israelite nation, they're the only nation that would crucify their God, but that out of all of God's worlds, this is the only world that would have crucified Jesus. So let's dive in and find out, is this true or is it just a cultural fancy? Fancy. I have been watching you guys. Oh my gosh. I, the other week had Pride and Prejudice as a part of my video. And I was talking about Mr. Darcy versus Mr. Wickham. And so I had to go on YouTube and kind of search for some clips. That is all that shows up on my YouTube now. And so I am loving it, but it's also making me say words like a cultural fancy. So let's dive in to see if this is a cultural fancy. So the source of this rumor actually, I believe comes from the scriptures. So first we've got our second Nephi 10, um, that talks about the Jews specifically. And then we get a vision in the Pearl of Great Price, um, that the amazing prophet Enoch had. And Enoch has this vision and it's recorded in the book of Moses. Let's see. It's Moses chapter seven. These are the beautiful verses where Enoch is, is talking to heavenly father and heavenly father is looking out on his creations and he's weeping because these people, his children are choosing not to choose him. And so let's look at, he says in verse 36, he says, wherefore I can stretch forth mine hands and hold all the creations, which I've made. So he is talking about all of the worlds that he has made. I assume actually, can I just say that? I cannot for certain state exactly what God means, but based on what he said, it looks like he's talking about all his creations, all the worlds he's created. And my eye can pierce them also. And among all the workmanship, this is where the rumor comes from, all the workmanship of mine hands, there has not been so great wickedness as among thy brethren. So this is God telling Enoch basically that out of all the creations, all the people he's made, all the worlds he's made, none are as wicked as the one on the earth that Enoch is on. And that's our earth. So if you put those two together, and this is another big jump is we don't know for certain that Jesus was the savior of all the worlds. There is, there is, there are grammars hard when a camera's on. Can I just say that there are quotes from many apostles that differ in opinion. So one apostle will say, uh, we don't know Jesus was the savior of every world. We can't know for sure. And then another apostle actually Russell M. Nelson said that Jesus was the savior of all the worlds. So this is making the assumption that Jesus was the savior of all the worlds. And if he was the savior of all the worlds and we are the wickedest world and the Israelites were the only nation that would crucify their God, then yes, this rumor would be true, but it all depends on is Jesus really the savior of all the worlds. So is this rumor true or false? Yes. If (laughs) does that clarify it for you? All right, let's dive into evidence. And today we are talking about monsters. Ooh, I'm so excited for this one. Okay. So In the Bible, you do not really get the word monsters. I think there is one instance of the word monster being used. So this is not something that Joseph Smith would have been familiar with the word monster. He's like, oh yeah, that showed up thousands of times in the Bible. I'm going to include it in the book of Mormon (laughs) and make everyone think it's real. In second Nephi nine, verse 10, Jacob is talking and he compares death and hell to a monster. He says, yay, that monster death and hell. Now, was this a mistake on Joseph Smith's part? Was this a little bit of overreaching? Like, oh, he was trying to get creative as he made up the Book of Mormon. And so he includes this word monster. Actually, no. Even though the Bible doesn't specifically, explicitly, is explicit always a bad thing? Or can I just say... I think, I I think it's okay. Even though the Bible doesn't explicitly say the word monster over and over, it does talk about monsters. 
So let's look at Isaiah 51, 9 through 10. He calls Rahab the dragon, okay? Is a dragon real? No, dragons are not real. I'm sorry if there are any children in here who think dragons are real. They're not. And then again, in Isaiah 27, Isaiah refers to Christ's triumph over evil as piercing a Leviathan. That's, I had to actually ask my kids about that. I'm like, what's a Leviathan? They read a lot of fantasy and they told me it's a dragon in the sea. Okay. Again, a fictional monster type character. Then in the book of Baruch, it's not included in our Bible, but it is in some other versions of the Bible. It refers to two great monsters, behemoth and Leviathan. So did Joseph Smith make a mistake in using the word monster in the book of Mormon? Absolutely not. He was actually translated an ancient record. And in ancient times, they talked about death and hell and Satan and all those things and referred to them as monster type characters. So did Joseph Smith make up the Book of Mormon? No, he didn't. Okay. You guys remember the scriptures are awesome. And so are you. So go dive into them. And if you have a kid or a teen, I have study guides for them. If you want to check them out in the description, I have a goal this year to get up to hundred thousand subscribers. Is that ridiculous? Probably, but I would love for you to help me get to that number. But the more people who subscribe, the more YouTube will push my videos out to other people who might be interested in studying the scriptures. And I love the scriptures and I want to get them out to the world. So if you would help me do that by subscribing, that would be great. All right. Have a great day. You are awesome. And I will see you later.